the uh, traditional Passover meal with the uh, using the Haggadah, the, the, the script uh, that is memorized by the Jewish people and used year after year, uh, dating back to the times of uh, the Exodus and uh, try and get to the depth of what it means for that to have been broken down and then turned into uh, what we celebrate each month with Holy Communion. And then uh, Friday, of course, is Good Friday. Uh, we'll be taking part in the uh, celebration of St. Martin's Lutheran Church at 7 p.m. Uh, I invite you to come and be part of uh, that uh, tenebrae style of worship uh, where the darkness gathers as we move through the uh, evening uh, and get closer and closer to the actual passion of Christ. And then, of course, next Sunday, we will uh, celebrate the risen Christ here today on Easter Sunday. All sorts of things going on in the life of your church. Take a look at the uh, newsletter and uh, keep up on what's going on. Stand and greet each other in the name of Christ.
Please stand for the call to worship. Holy, holy, holy Lord, our God, our Creator. Open our eyes and open our hearts that we might see you. That we might know and recognize the cost of our sin. Amen. Sometimes as a church we uh, miss dates on the calendar and they slip us by, but we always remember that we try our best to remember that God never forgets, 
And even though our fallible challenges might screw up a calendar, God knows and remembers each and every one. I'd like to ask Leanna Cheeseman to come up here. Good morning. How are you today? Good. You like to read? What do you like to read? Books. Well, that's always good. <laughs> Books come with words. Words are important. You have to learn how to read and, and take in those thoughts and make them your own and, and consider them and, and have them, right? Right? Okay. Well, we forgot to do this a long time ago. But when you get to second grade and you start to be able to read really well, we like to give a Bible. And so this isn't the right one. But this one is because it says, it says Brianna Cheeseman. And so there we go. Now we got the right one. We, as a church, want to give you a Bible that has all the words in it, just like the ones we have here in the church, and that we read all our scripture lessons from, and we hope that you'll take time to read this also as you study and learn and come to know Jesus and God just that much better. Congratulations. As a church, we make pledges to our little ones that collectively we will partner with the parents and create opportunities to grow and nurture the children in discipleship just another one of those pieces of how we fulfill that promise collectively. But it's on you to reach out and invest in our children and do so individually. Something to consider to turn to God with our prayer. Almighty God, we come this day celebrating and worshiping your name, lifting high the palms, watching the children process. We remember, remember how you commanded us to care for each and every one to lead them in the faith, to nurture them in your love. We ask that you play your blessing on our children as they continue to grow and learn and take to heart the message, Jesus loves me. We come this day that we might give you the thanks for the blessings you place in our hearts. The opportunities of a new Passion Week to unfold with new relevance as we seek to forgive and be forgiven. As we seek atonement at one moment, through your sacrifice on the cross, as we prepare to celebrate salvation, the joy and the promise 
the empty tomb. Walk with us through this week. Help us see the signs along the way to continue to develop our faith, our reconciliation, our hope in resurrection. We come this day to lift up the names of hurting people, family and loved ones who feel pains that are physical as well as spiritual. The pains that reside in our own hearts as well. Bring us peace, strength, comfort, and healing. As we ask that same peace to enter all the world. We do these things not for our glory, but to show our faith that you hear our prayers and that you answer. To walk more closely in the example of Christ whom you sent. To be his hands and feet and heart in this broken and hurting world. We come that we might lift up the words he taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
Good morning. I'm just going to come up here now every time Gloria's name is in the program. <laughs> Gloria uh, called me yesterday with a voice that sounded like this and said that she would not be able to be here and maybe we could switch sometime. <laughs> so I know it says Gloria, but I'm up here today to help you with the children's message. And, and, and so you guys all helped us celebrate Palm Sunday today, right? Mm -hmm. And we came in and you waved the palms, right? Why did they wave palms at Jesus? Do you know? Why? Because uh, they worshipped him. They worshipped him. They, they thought he was a king, right? Right? They thought he was a king. And so when a king came, they would get palms. And do you know where palms come from? Palm trees. Big, tall trees. Who's, who's been, been somewhere where they've seen palm trees before? They can be really tall, right? And, and so people would go and get palm leaves so that when important people came, they'd wave the palms and it would be like, even the trees were welcoming them. And that's why they would wave palm branches. Even the tree. Everyone is so happy they're here. Even the trees are waving. And they'd wave the palms. And what else did they do that day? Who knows? Do you remember what else they did that day to honor Jesus? They said, Hosanna. They said, Hosanna. Hosanna was an important word. It, it meant... It, it meant excitement and celebration, and it was reserved again for special, special, special people. And they did one more thing. They did one more thing. Who knows? Anyone? Who knows? Come on, somebody. Matt? They threw their coats on the ground. They took off their coats, and they threw them on the ground because the ground was so dirty. The roads were so yucky, they throw their own coats on the ground so the coats would get dirty and the important person's feet or even their horse or donkey or whatever they were riding, the feet of that person wouldn't be soiled by all the dirt. But instead, their own coats would be dirty. And those are all the things they did for Jesus. But they did that because they thought he was going to be a king. A king of where? No, nope, not a king of heaven. Jerusalem. They thought he was going to be a king of Jerusalem. They thought he was going to be a king of a place. Jesus, a king of a place? Yeah? Where? Heaven, okay. What's even more important than being a king of heaven? A king of our own hearts. Jesus wanted to be a king of people's hearts. Not a king of a place, but a king with us. Who's been to a parade? You know all the people in the parade? No. No. We don't. But Jesus wants to know us, and Jesus wants us to know him. And so we talk about these palms and how important they are, but part of it is to remind us that they didn't do it right that day. They were looking for the wrong kind of a king. But today we know better. We know that what this really means is we want Jesus to be a king of our hearts. Okay? So, I know we left the palms up here in the front, but I'm going to let you guys take one with you. So you can remember that lesson, okay? It's important to remember. Jesus wants us to be 
in our hearts, right? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the things you give us. Most importantly, your love, your care, and the opportunity to know you better. Help us to find place in our hearts for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. There you go. You want one? You can take one with you. Scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 12, verses 27 through 36. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where, you're, where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills, whence cometh my help. My 
help is in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Grant blessing on this time spent that the word spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard will be pleasing in your sight. Amen. I love a parade. Da 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 da. Parades are great. They bring people together to celebrate roses or pear blossoms or lights or Macy I'm Thanksgiving. Bands, floats, street sweepers, all the great parts of a parade. That's what Palm Sunday celebrates, right? A parade for Jesus. Go, Jesus! Wow, no one seems very convinced. That's what Hosanna really means, right? Yay, Jesus! But when I go to a parade, that isn't the only thing I do that day. It's only part of my day. Even the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which lasts like three, four hours because of all the song and dance that they break out into in the middle of it. It's not, it's not the only thing you do that day. Our Festival of Lights Parade is what, 40, 45 minutes long? Not counting all the time we wait for it to get here, mind you. There's other things that happen. So that's how it was for Jesus on Palm Sunday. The processional was only a small part of the day, maybe the grandest part of the day, but other things happened too. He went to the temple, a big thing for most people. He saw, he came, he left. He lamented over the city of Jerusalem, maybe before the processional, maybe after. All depends on whose account you read. He cursed the fig tree. He just zapped it dead with a disappointing look. And in the Gospel of John, we read today's lesson about addressing a small crowd of grief. That's who it is just seven verses earlier that John tells us Jesus was talking to. And while we tend to focus on the parade, the processional, the palms, there are other stories of significance that happen on that day. So you have to know the whole of all these connecting stories. So let's get just a little context and back all the way up to chapter 11. Chapter 11 of John is all about the rising of Lazarus. Jesus is traveling in the countryside, generally in the direction of Jerusalem. And everyone knows that the religious leaders want to kill Jesus if he goes to Jerusalem. So there's a lot of tension in the company and anxiety over the fact that they are headed to Jerusalem and what might happen. A side trip to Bethany because Lazarus has died. Jesus weeps, shortest verse in the Bible. Lazarus is risen. Most people rejoice. But not all. Chapter 12, according to John, the night before Palm Sunday, Mary, of Mary and Martha fame, sister to Lazarus, who has just risen from the dead, anoints Jesus' feet with expensive perfume. Judas is upset. Jesus praises Mary. They all go to bed. Next day, Palm Sunday, the religious leaders decide to add Lazarus next to Jesus on their hit list because he has risen from the dead. And they want to put him back there. Jesus tells the disciples to go get a colt, and they enter into Jerusalem. 
palms wave, coats get thrown on the floor. Hosanna! Yay, Jesus! Hosanna! And then a small group of Greeks want to meet Jesus. He begins to teach them. That's where we began our reading today. There's lots of contrasts and connecting points to the story. Several things that are really, really, really important. The point that Jesus is generally misunderstood by, well, everyone. His friends, the disciples, the religious elite, the Jews. They're seeking a king. The religious elite could have arrested Jesus just about any old time they wanted, and they certainly never needed Judas to betray him or identify him. Jesus usually spoke fairly plainly about what was going to happen, this whole plan to bring about salvation, and either nobody took him seriously or they just didn't believe or, we kind of caught a glimpse in today's reading, it was told in such a way that they just couldn't hear it. The voice of God sounds in their midst, and some only hear thunder. The others heard the word. This is all the whole of John 11 and 12, but they're major themes within the context of the whole of the gospel. We generally teach the story of Palm Sunday, just as we did with the children. Chasing after a false victory, a political triumph, the Jews line the streets to welcome a hero in a hero's fashion. Palm branches and hosannas, honors reserved for a king, because that's what they wanted to see, a conquering king to come and reclaim the throne of David and overthrow the oppressive reign, the Romans. So the people who have spent generations of lifetimes waiting for a Messiah miss the point when he comes. But Greeks, Greeks, code word for Gentiles, Greeks come from afar to meet and learn from Jesus. An aside, not in my notes. You have to note the ways these stories repeat. Who came to search for the baby Jesus? Were it the Jews? Or was it the kings from foreign countries, wise men, Gentiles, who understood the birth? We're into the Passion Week, and the Jews are looking in the wrong place. But the Greeks come to learn at Jesus' feet. And Jesus explains about what is about to happen. Death, pain, crucifixion, the removal of the light from your midst. And while it's not explicitly stated, the Greeks understood better than most certainly did. You see, I think today we still, 2,000 years later, miss the point you see, when we re sing the song, high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, it's not the light of ascending Jesus or returning Jesus or King Jesus in Revelation, high and lifted up. 
shining in the light of your glory is Jesus high and lifted up on the cross. Jesus in his glory, you know, the place where John and James asked to be seated when Jesus came into his glory, was at the left and the right of the cross, places reserved already for a murderer and a thief. They failed to understand the gravity of that which they asked. You'd think we know the difference by now, but you know when I look at worship slides that other churches use when they sing that song, I think they miss the point. It's a cautionary tale. Do we really get what we're talking about with these concepts that we throw about? Grace, love, mercy, reconciliation, salvation, or are they just buzzwords we use in church? All too often I see us using the words. But do we live them out? Leon was certain to be a gangster. Not the old time James Cagney movie sense, but that was far too out of fashion and benign. No, he was the drug-using criminal 1990s gangster that preyed on the weak and the defenseless. Or at least that's what Helen, the head nurse at the nursing home, thought when she saw him for the first time down the hall, pushing his cart around. She could see him mile away despite what human resources thought about him in hiring him. Tattoos all over the place, baseball cap worn at an obtuse angle, and the hair, oh my gosh, the hair. Of course, it only confirmed Helen's suspicions when Leon started paying close attention to Doris. Doris was an extreme dementia case. No one paid much attention to Doris. Doris would wheel her way around through the facility. She had no family left, no visitors. And all she ever did was complain loudly that she couldn't find her purse, that she wanted to go home. If only she could find her purse. Have you seen my purse? I want to go home. I need my purse. Nope, Doris, you don't have a purse. You are home. Yes, I do. It's red. It has my keys in it, my change purse, and my comb. No, Doris, I've told you before. I want to go home. Come on, Doris, why don't we take you to your broom? And off she would shuffle, sobbing, until she would meet the next person and the whole conversation would start over again. A hopeless case. It was only a couple weeks later, just after he had begun work, that Helen knew what he was up to. He was taking notes on what Doris was like and where she would go and he started following her around and he she just knew that what he was looking for was an opportunity to stash some drugs and then skirt her out the door so he could get them out on the street perfect plan as helen could see and she knew that she would follow him around that sneaky Leon and catch him. She knew for certain it was going to happen when he took her down a hallway where no one was at. So she got up where she could keep an eye on him and catch him right in the act 
Leon looked around, but he didn't see Helen's stealth pursuit. When he thought he had her alone, he pulled out the bag. And from it, he withdrew a red purse. And he opened it up and he showed her the comb and the small change purse and the keys that he had found lingering around that went to nothing in particular. And Helen stopped her sobbing and she clutched the purse. Expectations. Expectations can cloud what we see, how we act, what we believe. Jesus said, when I am high and lifted up, I will draw everyone to me. Grace, forgiveness, mercy, salvation. Everyone. Maybe we need to make sure we're not looking in the wrong place. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? <laughs> Finally found some ushers that can do this right. <laughs> Let's pray. Holy and living creator, you are a generous giver. And that's what we strive to be with our tithes and offerings. In our sharing of time and talent through the ministry of the church, we know that's where the similarity ends. We give a portion, a token. You gave your son Jesus. You offered us forgiveness and redemption from a lifetime of self-absorption self and disobedience. We dedicate these offerings to you, the greatest of all givers, unworthy servants, but for your grace and boundless love. In the name of him whose name is above all other names, in Christ we pray. Amen.
is our beginning in our time infinity in our doubt is our believing in our lives eternity in our death a resurrection at the last a victory unrevealed until its season something God alone can see go in peace amen Thank you.